We neither smoked nor drank alcohol, nor ever cursed or used vulgar words at any time in his life. He was a model of Christian virtue. Grant, on the other hand, smoked 20 cigars a day, was a binge drinker, but also detested vulgar, obscene language, bad jokes. He detested blasphemy. One time, when Grant was passing, when he was general, he passed a guy who was cursing out a mule, because that's what mule skinners and mule drivers do, they curse mules. Grant got so furious at the guy using the bad words in the mule that he said, tie that man to a tree, which they did for four hours. One time, when there are few times that Grant and Lincoln ever met, Grant was invited to the White House, and they had a dinner for him before the, just towards the end of the war. And after the dinner, Lincoln drew the men into the drawing room, and some smoked, and Lincoln, who was very fond of what we would call dirty jokes, closed the doors, and he looked around with the men, and he said, well, I see there are no uh, ladies present, so uh, there was this fella, and Grant suddenly put up his hand, and he said, wait a minute, but there are gentlemen present. Well, it sort of torpedoed the joke, of course, <laughs> but he probably went to the, the boots and muffler and said, get out of here. But anyway, um, Lee's, uh, excuse me, Grant's smoking was prodigious. He smoked, according to all witnesses, at least 20 cigars a day, and it probably led to his death. Um, he smoked um, all his life. He died from throat cancer. While he was dying, he was feverishly trying to write out his memoirs so that family would have some kind of an income because he lost his entire fortune after his presidential years because of a foolish investment in a stock market swindle where a crooked money manager absconded with all of Grant's fortune. His name was Frederick Ward, and actually he was a partner of Grant's son and of Grant's, but Grant didn't know anything about the stock market. He just got swindled. So he lost all his money. He had to go, when he's dying of throat cancer, he's writing as fast as he can. And actually the book turned out to be a very, very popular book. It was promoted by Mark Twain. Um, during Grant's presidency, he was a victim of every crook that came along. His cabinet members were described as very rich, very coarse, very greedy, very crooked. It was called Grantism. It came to mean the moral degradation of a political career. All of them, his appointees, as he used to say, fed from the public trough. Um, he was involved, he was president during the Credit Mobile scandal, the railroad scandal, the Star Route scandal. He had a terrible record. He didn't do all those things, but he was blamed for them. Um, he, was, he was friendly with two guys, Jay Gould and Jim Fisk, who were such crooks, such notorious crooks, that they um, made, a, made themselves millionaires by talking Grant into not releasing money, and so they um, altered the gold market, and they sold the gold before the government released any money. Well, it was another crooked scheme. In defense of Grant, he was never crooked. Nobody ever called him dishonest, but he was not what we would say the brightest bulb in the marquee. He owned no books, to my knowledge. He seemed to be devoid of culture. Once, when Grant was president, a Marine band leader asked him, he said, tell us your favorite song, President Grant, so we can play it whenever you show up at a, an affair. Grant thought for a while, he said, you know, I only know two songs, and one of them is Yankee Doodle and the other one isn't. Um, Grant's campaigns for the presidency were remarkably easy. He didn't campaign at all, but nobody wanted to, get, wanted to run against him because he was so enormously popular in the North in those years after the war. One time, a guy, an eccentric, queer, peculiar little vegetarian by the name of Horace Greeley ran against Grant. Well, Grant beat him. Decisively, Grant said one of the only funny things I can ever remember him saying. He said he described Horace Greeley. He said, "You know that fellow looks like the man on the moon with glasses." And if you ever see a picture of Horace Greeley, it's pretty close. Grant's problem with alcohol has been widely known. After the Mexican War, he was sent out to be a quartermaster at the small fort in California called Fort Humboldt. Wife and family were not allowed to go with him. And there he was terribly lonely. He began to drink often as in all-day drinking. Because of his drinking problem, he was cashiered out of the Army. Actually, he was told to resign, which he did in 1853. Now, then, there's a couple of historians who, in recent years who have said, oh, no, Grant didn't really drink so much. That's just a perception. I believe that to be entirely wrong. Um, actually, the way Grant got to be cashiered out of the Army, as I understand it, was that the commandant of the fort ordered a spot urine tests and 
Grant's specimen had an olive in it. <laughs> yeah, he drank a lot. Um, during the war, when he was winning out in the West, winning all those battles, he had a bodyguard, so to speak. It was a man by the name of Rawlins who watched him night and day, played him man to man, and made sure that nobody ever gave Grant any whiskey. One time, on a ship, uh, on a little riverboat down on the way down to Vicksburg, Grant somehow broke into the bar and he got terribly drunk. And this fellow and a guy named Cadwallader, newspaper writer, protected him until he was sober again. The much revered marble man, they used to call him after the war, Lee, because they had so many marble statues of him all over Richmond, uh, did not know what to do with his life after his surrender at Appomattox. He was invited out to a little college called Washington College in Lexington, Virginia, to be president. He was paid $1,200 a year. It provided him a home. He had 40 students. And by the time he left his presidency, he was in five years, and he died in the job in 1870. By the time he left, it had 600 students and 60 professors, and ever after it was called Washington and Lee University, and now one of the finest universities in the country. Uh, he never mentioned the war. He absolutely refused to mention the war. One time, the only time I can find out where Lee mentioned the war was a student who was failing in algebra came to talk to Lee. Lee said, you're going to fail in algebra if you don't pick up your grades. This kid suddenly turned to Lee and he said, well, General Lee, you failed. Well, naturally, what this young man deserved was a knuckle sandwich. But rather than that, Lee said, all right, very well. So don't you be a failure, too. The main thing that Lee wanted was to make his students in the South, in general, come back to the United States. He wanted no part of politics. And he wanted to make the South reemerge as it had been before the war. On one occasion, it was Lee's birthday in January of 1866. A bunch of the students, a lot of these guys were veterans of the old Army of Northern Virginia, Lee's old corps. Uh, they hired a band, and they got outside his window. It was his birthday in the early evening. And they got outside his window, and they gave the rebel yell, and then the band struck up Dixie and the Bonnie Blue Flag. Halfway through the song, Lee flung the windows open. He said, knock it off. The war is over. We lost the war. You go back. You become physicians and lawyers and keepers of the law and businessmen and farmers. You go back to becoming citizens of the United States. Well, I suppose they grumbled a little when they left, but that's how he was. Um, after the war, what remained of his life, Lee would spend his summers up at what they called the White Sulphur Springs, now called the Greenbrier in West Virginia. He would send his, spend his summers up there, and because his wife was an invalid, she would take the cures up there, the, the baths. And Lee, who was so flirtatious with the girls, and so handsome, and so patrician, and such a wonderful dancer, and the girls would all say, oh, that guy wasn't a general. He's too smooth. He's too good a dancer. He's a great, great, gregarious, funny fellow. You see, there were two Robert E. Lees. One's the dancer up at Greenbrier, the White Sulphur Springs. The other is on the battlefield. He's an alley cat. One time, he had a terrible temper. One time, at the Battle of Gettysburg, he got so angry that maybe he lost the battle. He was so angry at the Union Army out there opposing him that he said, we will strike them in the center. This was Pickett's charge, which is an ill-advised, unfortunate thing for the Confederate Army. His best advisor, his friend, his best general, General Longstreet, who, by the way, had been Ulysses Grant and Julia's best man at their wedding. Longstreet is with Lee. He says, I don't think that any 15,000 men can take that hill. Lee is furious. He said, the enemy is out there. We will take him where he is, like that. And he, of course, he lost. And another time, right before the Battle of Fredericksburg, it was just before, just after dawn. And Lee wants complete silence in his troops because you're hiding behind the Marie's Heights, the uh, stone wall. But there's always one soldier 